What's up guys, welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys watched my first video. If not, please do watch that before this one as they are related so you can check out part one. I'll link it up in the top right or left corner. I, I always suck at that, I'm not sure which one. So in this episode, I really wanna talk about consensus and how the blockchain network works in and of itself. I know we talked a little bit about it in the last video. We talked a lot about what blockchain is, but I wanna teach more about how it works and what a transaction looks like, what consensus looks like, all that sort of stuff. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So first things first, what does a transaction look like? Let's go over the anatomy of a transaction. And if you wanna see a graphic or something to really illustrate this visually, I'm gonna put an image up on the screen right about now. And you can also go to my blog post on my website, hashoshi.com, that's H-A-S-H-O-S-H-I.com, where you can read this in written format and you can see this graphic there as well. So every node on the network, like we talked about, has a public and private key. And based on that, those words, you can tell that the public key is something that's shared with the whole network, and your private key is something that you have to keep super, super safe and protected. And the public key is used to encrypt messages. So in this case, encrypt transactions or serve as the address to which transactions are made to. And you can think of this like a username. Your public key on the blockchain network is like your username. And your private key is the decryptor. So it takes a message that your public key has encrypted and it can decrypt that message, or in this case, transaction. So on the blockchain network, you can think of your private key like your password. If you wanna think about your digital wallet or your node like maybe a locked glass box, your public key is the address to which you can send things to that publicly available, publicly viewed glass box. Everyone can see generally what's in there, but they can't tell exactly whose it is unless they know your public key. But the only person who can open that box and take contents out or put contents in is you, because you have the key to the lock. That's something that's really important to note here is that Everything on the blockchain is transparent. The full ledger is owned by everyone on the network. But the only person who really has access to the transactions that pertain to them are the people who hold the keys. That being said, if you lose the keys, you're out of luck. So you have to protect your keys, especially your private key. That being said, a transaction really looks like a digital check. The address, your public key address is in the two line. Your private key is what you use to sign a transaction you're sending to someone else. And then there's there are a couple other fields. One of those is the transaction ID number to verify or to help the network validate what transaction it is if they wanted to query it later. But also there's the amount that you are trying to send. So it's really like a digital check if you really think about it. So let's think a little bit about how banks keep balance. So every month for your checking account, you get a statement balance. And this, this statement is all of the debits, so the amounts that have been um, taken away from your account for purchases and credits, things that have been credited back to you. And at the end of every month or whatever the cycle you have, you get this new statement balance from which future debit and credits are made. So you see that this balance kind of resets and it, it starts from a level ground every month. With Bitcoin and other blockchains like that, that's not really how it works. Instead, in your wallet, you have a collection of all the transactions that you own, quote unquote, for the lifetime of the protocol. So my Bitcoin balance is really a collection of all of the transactions giving me Bitcoins and transactions of me sending Bitcoins. That's my balance. And when I want to see my balance, it's go the protocol is going back through all my transactions, pluses and minuses, and determining, at, once those are all reconciled, how much do I have left? So 
I don't have a new statement where everything is compiled into one balance and all the transactions basically are issued and then go away and I have a balance that I can send and create new transactions from. The transactions stay there and that's what you create your balance from, no matter how long you have your node or your wallet. So when you create a transaction, let's just say Bob, for example, has plus one Bitcoin, plus 1.5 Bitcoins, minus one Bitcoin, and plus two Bitcoins. Those are all transactions in his wallet. And he wants to send Alice, his friend, one Bitcoin. Instead of creating a new transaction from his overall balance, a brand new transaction, instead, the protocol is just gonna take the plus one Bitcoin transaction that's in his wallet and essentially forward that over to Alice. And that establishes this traceability backwards so you can see, okay, this Bitcoin was once owned by Bob and he got that transaction from this person and this person and this person all the way back to the creation of that coin. And the reason for this is that instead of trying to create a balance and do all this extra math, the blockchain network really all it wants to do is just repurpose as much as possible. So you might ask, how do you send a part of a Bitcoin if you can only send transactions that already exist? So if Bob wants to send, let's just say half a Bitcoin, he doesn't have any transactions in his wallet that are worth just half a Bitcoin. So instead what he does is he issues a transaction and identifies both the inputs and the outputs exactly how he wants them. So think of it this way, if he has that plus one Bitcoin transaction, he can take that, forward it to Alice, and instead of saying plus one Bitcoin to Alice, instead it's gonna say, I want 0.5 Bitcoins to go to Alice, and then 0.5 Bitcoins to go back to Bob. That's what would really happen is you create your own change. And if you think about this in comparison to a banking system, if I wanna give my friend $75, I don't need to create a transaction for $100. Tell the protocol I want 75 to go to him and 25 to go back to me. But that requires a lot of extra you know, logic and quite frankly a lot of infrastructure to create a system in which you can carry a balance and you can add and subtract or debit and credit from that balance and create transactions from a balance that's calculated every month. Blockchain is extremely bare bones in that way, and it's really, really, really effective at what it does, and that is to cr help you create transactions that are extremely small, efficient, and instantaneous. So let's talk a little bit about consensus. What is it, and why does it matter? So the, f the first thing I really wanna make clear about consensus is that its main purpose is to facilitate the verification of transactions. It needs to incentivize nodes on the network to do the work required to verify transactions according to the rules. But it also needs to disincentivize nodes on the network from breaking the rules and doing things incorrectly on the blockchain network. So the way it does this is it requires an exceptional amount of processing power and electricity for miners to verify transactions. But conversely, they're also rewarded handsomely if they find the answer to this, this puzzle and they win the competition to mine their block. So in essence, you've created this process where you have no third party. I know we talked about this a little bit in the first video, but there's no bank there to verify these transactions by hand. It's all done by the protocol and the miners are there to lend their computing power and to lend their computers to help verify these transactions based on the rules of the network. So you have this disintermediated transaction network where every node of the network participates and keeps a copy of the ledger in full. So there's full transparency, full auditability, and it's completely distributed and shared. And the, the last thing that I really wanna make clear about this is that the consensus process is designed and the rules of the blockchain are designed to prevent double spend and fraudulent transactions. And double spend means someone taking the same Bitcoin or the same Ether and sending that same token to two different people. And this actually happens in the real world. If you've ever bought something on eBay, it's very possible that you've purchased something 
they've taken your money, but the person that you bought it from has actually sold the same item to two people. And you're out of luck. One of you is going to get the item and the other one's not. And eBay's done a really good job of using PayPal to help facilitate this transaction securely. But there's really no way to control that item or the person that's saying, I have one of these items or two of these items and I'm going to send it to, they promised to send it to five people and there's only three items, there's no way that it's going to happen. Blockchain's designed to prevent that from happening. So how does the process work? So as transactions flow in from different nodes, so let's just say I'm making transactions, bunch of, a bunch of you guys are making transactions, those transactions are going into a queue. And it's pretty much like a line. They're just waiting in line. And what's happening simultaneously is that miners' computers are going in and verifying that A, those transactions are valid. In other words, they follow the rules of the network so they're not trying to send two or they're not trying to send the same bitcoin to two different people or the same two of the same ether to you know five people and these miners are collecting all of these transactions and putting them into prospective blocks and i call them prospective because they haven't been confirmed yet and the way that these blocks get confirmed is by miners competing to solve a really really difficult puzzle. And it's a mathematical puzzle and it's not a person viciously typing on their keyboard trying to solve a math problem but rather their computer trying to solve a math problem and be the first one to solve it and broadcast their answer to the network. And the reason for this is because of proof of work. I know we talked about this in the last video. It's something that's a piece of data that's really hard to obtain but very easy to verify. It's the same exact process here. So the miner that solves the problem first and broadcasts it to the network, as in broadcast the answer, it's very easy for the network to verify that it's correct. And if the miner gets the correct answer, or one of the miners gets the correct answer, they broadcast to the network and they win the right to mine their block and append it or add it on to the blockchain. So you get this never ending chain of blocks. And the only way that blocks are created is if miners do this work. And to f incentivize them to do this work, there's a reward involved. So right now in the Bitcoin network, for example, the reward is 12 and a half Bitcoins if you are to successfully mine a block. So at the time of filming this video, a Bitcoin is worth between 18 and 19,000 US dollars. So if you think about that, this is astronomical it's worth an exceptional amount of money just to mine a block. So you can see where the incentive is for miners to do this job and to do it consistently and to lend all this electricity and processing power to the process. And the reason why it disincentivizes them from trying to cheat the network is if they cheat the network, false transactions get flooded into the network and the protocol fails. The very currency that they are paid in, which is Bitcoin or Ether or whatever else, it's devalued. People no longer trust the network, therefore they, their assets are worth less. So you, cre you create this micro-economy in which consensus is a key cog. It keeps everything in control and helps facilitate the verification of transactions between all of the f participants on the network. And look, consensus isn't perfect. Right now, Proof of work, one of the, ma the main consensus protocol we've talked about here, is, to be fair, extremely inefficient. In terms of electricity, it does the job extremely well. However, it's extremely, extremely taxing on infrastructure and electricity to, f to get this proof of work. Right now, it, it takes an entire nation of electricity to mine a block. And it's something that's not efficient in the long term. And there are exceptional amounts of people trying to solve this, this problem and find something that's both power efficient and effective at doing what proof of work does. So in the future, we'll see that develop as more and more protocols come to the table. So keep that in mind. Consensus is an essential process. And I will create a video that's more of like a, you know, maybe a technical deep dive about how in-depth consensus in the proof-of-work variety 
truly, truly works. I'll talk about what the problem that they're trying to solve is, the math problem. I'll talk about some of the technical details around how it, the protocol itself was created. And uh, definitely let me know if you guys want to hear anything more about consensus or proof of work. Leave me a message in the comments and I will definitely respond to you guys. So I hope you guys understand consensus a little bit better now that you've watched this video. Definitely let me know if there's anything more that I can add in future videos on this topic to make it easier to understand or just to really flesh out the details a little bit more. If you're interested in a like a 201 type of video series on consensus and proof of work, definitely let me know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for future videos. So the last thing that I want to talk about today is really twofold. One of those is the concept of trust in in blockchain really. And I've sort of noticed this in the industry, it's really on a, on a curve. As the level of trust goes from low to high, you have a, a lessening need for a powerful consensus mechanism like proof of work. Proof of work is really designed for an extremely low trust environment. Let's just say where I want to transact with someone across the globe that I may have never met to buy, you know, to buy goods or services. However, in an environment where it's an extremely trust-oriented exchange, so let's just say I want to just send money to my girlfriend, I know that I trust my girlfriend with my money and she trusts me to send her what I owe. So in that case, you might not need as powerful of a consensus mechanism. So there are other mechanisms like things like proof of authority, proof of stake. There are other things that you can, or other consensus mechanisms that you can use with the varying levels of trust that there are in the network that may even be more efficient and effective than proof of work in those instances. So I'm gonna talk more about those in future videos. I'm definitely gonna do a video about proof of stake soon because it's extremely relevant in the news for the Ethereum protocol. And it's a really exciting one and really cool one that you guys should, should start to, to understand and get to know. And the final thing is is that People always ask me why Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these coins are worth so much. And that's really because it takes an exceptional amount of work via proof of work to create these coins. And I say create these coins because the only way that new Bitcoins are created is by miners mining a block. Every time a miner mines a block, they're not getting 12 and a half Bitcoins from other people they're getting brand new Bitcoins that have never been created before. And that's the only way that these new coins can be created. So it's an extremely limited asset and it's a capped asset. And so that's why Bitcoins are worth so much because so many people want them. They're so difficult to get and there are so few of them. Supply and demand drives this value up. So a lot of people say, oh, well, Bitcoins are nothing. They're not worth anything. To be fair, there is no asset that backs a Bitcoin, but it's all about supply and demand. It's how difficult it is to attain, how few of them that there are, and the fact that there are only going to be 21 million Bitcoins that will ever be created. It's the first time that a digital asset has been capped and really treated like something that you get out of the ground, like gold. There's a limited amount and a lot of people want it. That's what drives the price so high. So remember that consensus is the only way that new coins can be created in these traditional blockchains like Bitcoin and some of the others. Definitely keep that in mind. It's a really important topic and definitely keep watching the prices. The prices are extremely volatile. There's a ton of stuff going on every single day and you can always feel free to shoot me a message. Leave me messages in the comment section and I will be sure to answer all of those. So thank you guys for joining me for the second video of this series, the final video of this trilogy. You know, the Blockchain 101 trilogy is coming very soon. Uh, I think the post on my blog is gonna come out probably tomorrow. And it's gonna talk about blockchain in the market and what to watch for. So definitely come on back, subscribe to my channel, and thank you guys again. Have a good one.